Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live today. I'm so glad to see so many of you in the audience from all over the world. I see, let's see, Judy from Georgia, and we have Erica from Hungary, Inbal from Israel, um, Peter from Germany, so uh, Debbie from Idaho, thank you to all of you tuning in from all over the world. It's so great to see you all here with us today at a little bit of a different time slot than we normally do our Facebook Lives, just to bring more great genealogy, family history, and DNA content to all of you, uh, no matter where you're located around the world. And that's something that we just love about these Facebook Lives. We get to connect with our users from all over, from the four corners of the world. So thank you to everyone for tuning in, no matter what time it is during your day right now. Uh, so great to see you all with us. We have a fabulous, fabulous session for today. And before we get to it, I just want to let you know about a couple things that we have going on here at My Heritage. So firstly, we have a Easter DNA sale that has been extended and is now on until the 11th, until April 11th. So we'll be talking a lot about My Heritage DNA today, and it's a great opportunity for you to check out our sale. We're going to be putting a link in the comments section, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll put a link there in the comments, and you can take advantage of this fantastic sale that we have on My Heritage DNA Kits. Um, I see, oh, Kelvin says, first time on this channel. So welcome, welcome to all of you who are viewing our Facebook Lives for the very first time and also to our returning viewers. Great to see you all. Thank you for tuning in. If you just uh, connected, let us know where you're joining us from today. In addition, I want to let you know about something else that we released this week on My Heritage. Uh, we have a new, a relatively new uh, photo feature, which is called Deep Nostalgia, which allows you to take family photos and animate them so that you can see your loved ones and family members in photos, uh, you know, moving and smiling. And just this week, we released 10 new animations, special animations for this feature. So now in addition to those original animations that you could do with your uh, photos on Deep Nostalgia, you can now do other things such as see your loved ones nod, um, you can show them dance <laughs> amongst other uh, special animations that we are now offering. So go and check that out if you haven't yet. Um, besides for that, we'll be doing a giveaway at the end of today's show. So we'll be giving away one My Heritage DNA kit to a lucky winner. Um, all you have to do to enter is either leave a question for our speaker, or you can just leave a comment and let us know what you've discovered with My Heritage DNA. We love hearing the stories of our users when they have connected with relatives around the world, found out information or found relatives that they didn't know about before. So please leave us a comment and let us know what you've discovered using My Heritage DNA. And at the end of today's session, at the end of the questions, we will be giving a My Heritage DNA kit to one lucky winner. So stay tuned for that at the end of today's session. So now I'd like to introduce Morris Gleason, our speaker for today. He is a genetic genealogist. He is an administrator of several surname DNA projects. He works with adoptees and with people of unknown parentage and has appeared on Irish TV as a consultant for the TV series Adoption Stories. He authors several blogs, is a regular contributor to genealogical magazines, and his YouTube videos on genetic genealogy are very popular. He has organized the annual DNA lectures for Genetic Genealogy Ireland since 2012, and he is a well-known international speaker. And we are just so lucky to have him with us today to share his knowledge and to tell us why my heritage DNA ticks all the boxes. So let me bring Morris on to say hello to everyone. Hello. Hello. Hi, uh, Esther, and hi, everyone. In fact, we have such an international audience uh, today. I should be saying bonjour, buenos dias, buongiorno, welcome, and um, uh, great to see so many people joining us from all around the world. It, it really is fantastic. That's that's really the the great part of these Facebook Lives. We get to connect with friends from all over. It's fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. Great. Well, uh, and thank you, Esther, for organizing this. It's um, uh, 
great to to finally be speaking on Facebook Live for my heritage, um, seeing as how such it is a great company and has done such wonderful things over the last um, several years since it launched, and really has to be commended for its innovation. And I'll be talking a lot about that during the course of the presentation. Fantastic. We can't wait. Cool. Well, shall I go ahead then? Yes. And share my screen and all the necessary things. Just make sure that everything's there. So I'm going to start sharing now. You let me know if there's any problems, but you should be able to see my PowerPoint slide presentation just there. OK, one moment. Let me just bring it into the screen. There we go. We're all set. Oh, fantastic. OK, um, shall I fire ahead then? Yes, that would be great. OK, here we go. Well. Uh, Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to talk to you today about why my heritage DNA ticks all the boxes. Um, as uh, Esther said, um, I've been involved in genetic genealogy for quite some time um, and recently was made an honorary research fellow at Strathclyde University. Um, but you'll find lots of information about me if you just do a simple Google search for my YouTube or blog, um, uh, blog website just by uh, typing in DNA and family tree research, just all as one word. And that will bring up my YouTube channel and my blog. So the sort of topics we're going to discuss today include um, uh, comparison across companies. I'm going to compare my heritage to all the other companies out there so that you can see um, how my heritage uh, ticks all the boxes, as we say at the beginning of the presentation. Um, I'm also going to be talking about access to family trees, and my heritage is really good in this regard. We'll be also looking at three-way comparisons. I'm going to talk about clustering. I'm also going to show you about uh, how to build a shared DNA matrix and an ancestral chart for each of the clusters that you can generate from uh, the clustering tool on my heritage. Um, then we'll talk about some techniques for getting back into the 1700s, because Getting back to about 1800 is, is pretty, uh, pretty easy a lot of the time. Um, but getting back into the 1700s is much more of a challenge. And I'll show you some techniques for doing that. And then we'll take a look at triangulated segments at the very end, because that's what I'm currently working on. And um, we will see some of the challenges and some of the successes that one can have with each of these various techniques. So here's a table that really just summarizes the pros and cons of each company. And uh, you can see we have the companies here at the top, Ancestry, 23andMe, MyHeritage, Family Tree DNA, Living DNA, and GEDmatch. And um, in terms of uh, family trees and access to family trees, Ancestry is good, MyHeritage is actually better. Um, and then Family Tree DNA is not so good, 23andMe and Living DNA, they don't really figure at all. And I'm going to take a close look at that. Then we have access to records. And you can see that my heritage is very good in that regard. So is Ancestry, 23andMe, Family Tree DNA. They're not associated with any records at all. So you can't actually do any research on these websites. Um, raw data upload. Uh, Ancestry does not allow raw data upload. Near, neither does 23andMe. But my heritage does, as do the other uh, two companies and GEDmatch. And then in terms of shared matches, uh, most of the companies are pretty good, but MyHeritage and Ancestry are probably the best. Ethnicity estimates, you can get those from all of the companies. Um, MyHeritage have recently upgraded theirs. Um, and then we have uh, through lines from Ancestry and the theory of family relativity from MyHeritage. And this is a very useful way of uh, cutting through all the thousands of your matches and finding out who connects where. Um, the companies that offer an X match comparison are 23andMe and Family Tree DNA. Uh, GEDmatch also has it, but Living DNA, MyHeritage, and Ancestry do not. So this is one of the only boxes that MyHeritage doesn't tick, but um, hopefully that will change at some stage in the future. The three-way comparison we'll talk about as well, and again, MyHeritage, I think, really comes out on tops with this uh, particular uh, technique. Um, 23andMe also offer it, but uh, the offering from MyHeritage, I think, is, is slightly better. Um, the ability to split your matches into those on your paternal side, those on your maternal side, all of the companies offer that. 
But uh, as far as clustering is concerned, uh, my heritage has taken the wonderful clustering tool developed by EJ Blom and uh, have incorporated it into their offering. So we'll take a closer look at that. We will also, uh, sorry, there we go, take a look at triangulated segments, um, which uh, my heritage is the only company that actually reports on these uh, triangulated segments and does it in a very user-friendly way. Um, we'll mention the genetic tree as well, and it's only 23 and me that are doing that currently. And then we have what I call a rubbish filter because of our thousands of matches, quite a few of them will be po false positives unless we filter out the rubbish. And Ancestry do this quite well with uh, algorithms like Timber and Underdog. Uh, my, t my heritage have their own uh, mechanisms as well. And I'm not sure if Living DNA and 23andMe uh, have anything in place. Uh, Family Tree DNA don't have anything as yet, but apparently they will be changing that shortly. And then lastly, we have the chromosome browser, and my heritage has one. Uh, Ancestry notably do not. And that can be useful from time to time for specific situations. But my, my three favorite tools are the, the theory of family relativity, the three-way comparison, and the triangulated segments. I'll throw in the clusters there as well, um, because that really does help understand what you are looking at. So in terms of being best for tools, I'd say MyHeritage ticks most of those boxes, um, and then the second one would be GEDmatch. Uh, but I think, uh, and like I said at the beginning, MyHeritage is to be commended for all of the innovation that they've taken over the years that have allowed them to tick uh, virtually every single box you see in this particular table. So let's start off then with um, access to family trees. And a good question, to start with is how many of your matches have a family tree? And I've always, uh, I mean, this is such an important aspect of things because if you have a DNA match who doesn't have a family tree, you're stuck. You know, they may be, they may be a first cousin. They may look like a first cousin, but if you, if you don't actually have a family tree associated with that DNA, you're back to square one. Uh, you don't know who their parents and who their grandparents were, and you're not able to connect them up to your family tree. So it is very, very important that um, your matches have a family tree linked to their DNA test. And I wanted to see how many of my matches had a family tree and comparing them across the companies. So what I did was I simply went to my matches. Now, I know my top matches fairly well because uh, I've got second cousins tested, uh, first cousins, that sort of thing. Um, so I went to the first 33 matches that were less than 100 centimorgans, less than 100 cm. And I uh, collected 27, um, uh, sorry, out of these 33 matches, 27 on Ancestry had a family tree, none on um, 23andMe had a family tree, 29 out of 33 on my heritage at a family tree, and only 12 out of um, 33 on family tree DNA had a family tree. And if we convert that into percentages, this gives us 81% of um, ancestry matches had a family tree, but 87% of my heritage matches had a family tree. Only 36% of family tree DNA customers uh, had a family tree. Um, among these first 33 matches beyond 100 centimorgans. And um, some of the trees were linked to the DNA. 63% uh, of Ancestry's uh, family trees were linked to the DNA, but 100% of my heritage family trees were linked to the DNA. And that's because my heritage does it automatically, whereas with Ancestry, you have to go through a rather convoluted process to link your tree to your DNA. Um, interestingly, nobody had trees on 23andMe. And this is kind of in keeping with the fact that they're mainly interested in medical risk assessment rather than genealogy. Um, but 23andMe did not, they, they were the worst of the four major companies. Now, 50% of people had put in some surnames, but that's not uh, as helpful as having a family tree. Similarly, on family tree DNA, 64% of people had no tree whatsoever. So my heritage came out tops um, because they had um, most of their matches, the, the most matches with, with family trees, and 
uh, of those, all of them had their DNA linked to the family tree. So you didn't have to go uh, rooting around and searching for it. But only 25% of um, family tree DNA, oh yes, in terms of the number of people in the tree, um, uh, only 25% of uh, family tree DNA uh, people had uh, more than 100 people in their trees, uh, but 31% of my heritage people had over 100 people in their trees. So again, my heritage came out on top in terms of the number of people in these family trees. So if we take a look at my heritage, and this is, uh, say, some of your matches as they might appear, it'll say whether or not that particular match is associated with the family tree and how many people in it. This is really, really useful because some companies don't actually tell you uh, how many people are in a tree. Now, with this particular individual, I can tell that this is a substantial family tree and this is somebody that could um, really solve one of my problems. Um, but if the family tree only has five people in it, then I'm probably not going to get very far with that particular match. So having access to uh, substantial family trees is really, really important. And it's very easy to, to view the tree. You simply click on the button. Now, in terms of the number of people with family trees, there are 52 million family trees on the MyHeritage website. And there are over 12.5 billion records, which means that you can actually research your family trees on the website. And the great thing about MyHeritage is it has a very um, European focus. Uh, if we contrast that with Ancestry, for example, we see a different um, a different kind of focus is more on the American side. And the trouble with Ancestry is you have to be sure to link your DNA to your position in your family tree. And you know this is important for uh, through lines to operate. If you don't do this linkage, then through lines does not work. Uh, through lines is Ancestry's version of the theory of family relativity. Now, uh, it's quite easy to link. You go to settings, you click on change, and then uh, you select the particular family tree, enter the name, and then link the DNA results. And then it comes up as this test is shown to matches as ABC or whatever initials you want to use. You can use your name if you want. It's linked to John Smith in the family tree. Family trees on Ancestry, there are over 100 million family trees on Ancestry, and there are 27 billion records. So between Ancestry and MyHeritage, these are the two major sites for actually um, researching to see family trees and building family trees yourself, but also looking for family trees that may be relevant to your own particular research. On 23andMe, um, you can put in details of your family tree in your profile. So here, for example, is I've put a link in to my family tree. You click on that, it takes you to my family tree on Ancestry. If I go to my matches, for example, my DNA relatives, and let's click on this one here, AS. We bring up AS, uh, she's born in 1952. Um, this is the amount of DNA we share. And when it comes to comparing my genealogical information with hers, she has nothing. There's nothing there. So there's no genealogical information here at all. And really, um, 23andMe do not make it easy to put in genealogical information. They don't have a family tree utility. Well, we'll talk about their genetic tree later on, which is a poor substitute because you have to build it from scratch. There are no records on 23andMe, so you can't do genealogical research. Uh, the linking is not easy, it's not intuitive, and most people don't do it. Probably because um, a good 70 to 80% of people are largely interested in the medical side of 23andMe. At Family Tree DNA, uh, you can build your own tree. You can either create it yourself or upload a GEDCOM file. And um, the sort of tree information that you, well, the, the, you can put tree information about your family tree in there. You can also link your matches to the family tree. But the problem is opening the family tree takes forever and ever and ever. And um, sometimes when you open one of your matches family trees, you find there's only three people in it. 
there's no indication of how many people are in the tree before you actually go and try and open it up. So family tree DNA's family tree utility is really rather basic. And um, you can do the GEDCOM upload, which cuts out a lot of time if you know how to do a GEDCOM. Um, there are no records, and the website is extremely slow. So I tend to find it very, very frustrating. Now, if your match doesn't have a family tree, you can find one. So for example, you, you, can, you may have their name. You may even have their email address. You may even have their most distant ancestors. Um, you may have ancestral surnames. And you can simply do a Google search for their name or email address. You can use the term genealogy before it, and that could actually help you. Um, uh, search name, username, email, the most distant known ancestor. Um, there may be an online tree. So you can search for these most distant ancestors on the various online tree websites. Um, and if all else fails, you may have to try building a family tree for your match yourself by uh, doing detective work on social media, Facebook, uh, Twitter, that type of thing, to see if you can find out this individual and find out information about their family that allows you to build their family tree. Lastly, if you can't find a tree, you could try contacting your match. But the problem here is some people don't reply. Um, I have waited for two years for a reply um, at times. Uh, some won't share their private tree, and some only give partial information in their tree, which means that you then have to do the work of completing the building of their tree. So this can take forever. and. Um, uh, I would, it's much easier if everything is just laid out in front of you. Um, so those are some of the uh, pros and cons of uh, getting access to family trees. My heritage comes out on top. Um, also, my heritage and ancestry have the best access to records so you can research your own tree. Now, I'm also going to talk about three-way comparison. Let's talk about that now. Um, because this is something that is really quite important, especially when we come to doing some more in-depth work. But here are my my heritage matches. There's uh, my dad, Morris Gleason Sr., and here's uh, his first cousin once removed, Charles. So let's call dad uh, person A, uh, Charles person B, and the comparison between the two is A versus B and they share 492 CMs of DNA with each other. And um, that's what all of the companies allow you to do, A versus B, um, A versus C. But what uh, my heritage allows you to do is it allows you to compare B versus C. So here are the matches that are common to both A and B. So my dad, A, and Charles, B, they have all of these matches in common. First person here. Um, uh, we can look at my dad versus this first person, and that is A versus C, and uh, it's me. Uh, it, it, I share 3,500 CMs with my dad. But what my heritage does, it also allows B to compare it with C. And that is something that you only get on um, my heritage and 23andMe. You cannot do this on Ancestry, and you cannot do this on Family Tree DNA. Now, you can also compare B versus D, B versus E, B versus F, and so on. So in essence, this three-way comparison that uh, MyHeritage has allows you to compare um, each of your matches against each other. And that is really, really uh, uh, important when we come to building uh, a shared DNA matrix, shared autosomal DNA matrix. Here's one that I am currently working on. Uh, these results that you see here are uh, from Ancestry. I've got access to my dad's DNA, and I can see how much DNA he shares with all of these matches over here. I also have access to my cousin's DNA, and I can see how, uh, uh, how much DNA he shares with all of these uh, relatives over here. But all the Xs, they simply represent... Um, I know that they, they share DNA, but I don't know how much because I'm not allowed to have this B versus C comparison. 
And that's why my heritage is really, really good um, in that regards, because it does allow you to compare what your matches share with each other. And if these matches were had tested with my heritage, I would be able to fill in this entire table uh, very, very easily with uh, the amount of DNA that each person shares with every other person. And I'll tell you why that's important shortly. So we're going to come on now to auto clusters. And uh, this section down here, uh, m you can do this through the Genetic Affairs website, but MyHeritage and GEDmatch have actually integrated the tool that was developed by EJ Blom in the Netherlands, and it is now part of their offering on their own websites. So let's take a look at the auto cluster tool. And there's uh, EJ Evert Jan is his full name, and there's his website, Genetic Affairs, and it allows you to automatically cluster your matches into clusters of shared matches. So each of these clusters would be a group of people who, in theory, share the same common ancestor. And this really was uh, one of the most remarkable and ingenious inventions of, of recent years. And so much so that um, uh, my heritage and GEDmatch, like I say, incorporated it into their, their offerings that they have on their websites. But you can use EJ's, EJ's website, geneticaffairs.com, to do it for 23 for family tree DNA. And you used to be able to do it for ancestry, but they put a barring order on it, and it may be that that never comes back. Um, it was very, very useful to have this facility, but Ancestry found that it put too much of a drain on their, on their system. And so they had to ask EJ to, uh, to stop uh, providing that service for Ancestry matches, uh, which is a great pity. But um, this is, this is uh, the MyHeritage website, and there are various ways, apart from clustering, there are various ways that we can sort our matches into paternal and maternal. So for example, if we go to these little notes here, we can put in a maternal uh, note. And I've done that for um, most of my matches. And now you can hover over the note and, and it just brings up a little pop-up box. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can export your entire DNA match list uh, into an Excel spreadsheet and you can cluster people into various groups that way. But the other thing on the tools menu on the MyHeritage website is that you can click on the auto cluster function and that will allow you to generate clusters of shared matches for um, uh, a, a sizable proportion of your top matches. And in this particular example, there are 113 people in, I think that's around about 34 different clusters that have been generated by the auto cluster tool. And the members of each cluster, in theory, should be related via a common ancestor. So now what you can do is go to each cluster, and there's a very um, handy uh, box at the end of the, um, di uh, below the diagram, that allows you to see uh, exactly what's happening within each cluster. So for example, with cluster one, there are five members, and here we can see the amount of DNA they share with you. And uh, if we click on uh, their names here, it links to their particular page on MyHeritage. Again, very, very handy. And um, it also tells you how many people they have in their family tree, and if you click on the number, it takes you to their family tree. So this is a wonderfully user-friendly tool that has been incorporated into MyHeritage's suite of innovative tools. There are some caveats with clustering. You have to be aware of pile-up segments. Now, these could be uh, just segments that uh, a lot of people share because they've been knocking around in the population for generation after generation after generation. And they may make some of your matches look more closely related to you than they actually are. So we need to be careful about them. 
The other thing, of course, is that um, as you go further back in your family tree, the chances of you and your match being connected via a second connection, or even a second and a third connection, uh, that becomes greater and greater. So the further you go back, the greater the likelihood is that you are related to somebody via um, not just one ancestral couple, but maybe two or three. And this is a particular problem in um, populations that might be uh, subject to endogamy. So Ashkenazi Jewish, um, Romani Gypsy, Seventh-day Adventist, and in fact, any small isolated rural community. Uh, so there's plenty of them in Ireland. And uh, I've certainly found that, uh, say, for example, Donegal and Kerry, uh, you'll find that a lot of people have second and third connections uh, in their family tree to a specific match. But clustering allows you to focus your research on a specific ancestor or a specific ancestral couple. And it can be very, very helpful in that regard. Now, just be aware that, the, that clustering uh, has a threshold. You see the minimum threshold here is 25 um, and the shared DNA match minimum threshold is 20. So it's only going to cluster people who share at least 20 CMs. But if we look at our family trees, we'll see that the vast majority of people in, sorry, among your matches, the vast majority of people share less than 20 CMs. And of those, so it's only a small proportion, 13% in, in this example, only a small proportion are um, qualify, qualify for clustering. And of those that qualify, only half of them make it into a cluster. So you can see um, those in blue are those matches that share more than 20 CMs with my dad and have managed to make it into one of these clusters here. But there's another 6.5% um, who uh, do have greater than 20, but they're not in a cluster. So just be aware that most of your matches will be less than 20, and only about half of your matches over the 20 centimorgan uh, threshold will end up in a cluster. The rest of them will either be singletons. So for example, there's just my dad and, and a match that match each other. They don't match anybody else in the database. Or my dad matches somebody who is, say, 21 CMs, and the two of them match five other people, but they're all 19 CMs, and that is below the shared DNA match minimum threshold, so they won't appear in a cluster. So the clustering of people greater than 20, you're looking at maybe down to the fourth cousin level. So that's just something to be aware of. Now, JetMatch take the clustering one step further by uh, using a, a tier one tool. And it's uh, very similar to what we've seen before, but you can actually adjust the thresholds. You can adjust the lower threshold uh, as much as you like and the upper threshold as much as you like. And um, this is the kind of clustering uh, report that you get. Um, here's a cluster, an orange cluster. You can, what you can then do is you can sub subject them to a multi-kit analysis and you can actually fill in each square in this cluster with the amount of DNA shared by every member of that cluster. Uh, you can tick each individual box, first of all, or take a shortcut, and in the legend, you can just tick the color and it automatically ticks everybody in that particular colored box. So tick them first, and then submit them to a multi-kit analysis and let's pretend it's this orange cluster we're looking at. Click on Submit, and it brings up this autosomal matrix comparison, what I call the shared autosomal DNA matrix. Sorry, let me go back. There we go. And here you can see in this matrix, it's actually filled in the amount of DNA that appears in this particular cluster. We're pretending it's the orange cluster. It's actually a different um, cluster that I've looked at. Um, so uh, what we are getting now is that each of these squares is filled in with the amount of DNA that people share. And this is really useful because immediately 
I'm looking at 3,500 CMs shared between these two people here. That immediately tells me it's a parent-child relationship between these two people. I'm also looking at the 371 shared between these two people here. And this tells me they're either first cousins once removed or possibly second cousins. I'm also looking at the 181 and the 145. 181 shared between these two people, 145 shared between this person and the top person. They're probably second cousins once removed. So now I'm getting a, an idea of exactly how people are related to each other within this orange cluster. And 23andMe take this one step uh, uh, further and based only on the amount of DNA shared by people in a cluster, they're able to generate a, a tree, a family tree based purely on the DNA and how much DNA people share with each other. Now, you can go into this and you can you know, put in actual relationships and then their algorithm recalculates things. And um, uh, I think several other people are working on this type of tool, but it's a natural progression from number one, you find a, a identify a particular cluster. Number two, you find out how much DNA everyone within the cluster shares with each other. And then number three, you build this best fit DNA tree based on that information. Um, now, there are other clustering tools that are quite nice. There's the, uh, the DNA GEDCOM tool use uh, the, the Collins Leads uh, method of clustering. And there's also a tool developed by, I think it was David Neal. And um, uh, this is very fast, actually, much faster than what you see on DNA GEDCOM. Uh, but it only works for iPhone and iPad. So. I think the key message here is that tools are being developed all the time. And I think there are going to be some exciting times ahead when people start uh, mastering the concept behind the technology and then making the technology uh, faster, more efficient, and more user friendly. So exciting times ahead from the clustering uh, community. Now, we can generate auto clusters for each DNA database, Ancestry, MyHeritage, 23andMe, and so on. But can they all be joined up together? Is there an integrated solution that allows you to take your clusters generated for each of the different companies and put them into one place? And the answer is yes, we're getting there. And for this, we have to thank Johnny Pearl, who runs the DNA Painter website. And he's got the cluster Auto Painter. And this takes your cluster file and segments and generates a chromosome map with the segments grouped by cluster. And this can be really, really helpful. What it allows you to do then is it allows you to see which segments are present in each cluster of shared matches. But not only that, you can actually start making notes uh, on each of these clusters. So it allows you to edit and annotate uh, each cluster, but also you can combine and merge clusters together. So uh, if you find that cluster six from MyHeritage is actually uh, the same as cluster nine from Ancestry, you can merge those two clusters together. And in that way, you're merging data from the separate companies into one integrated solution. Um, it also allows you to identify likely pileup segments. And these would be segments that have a huge number of people all matching the same segment. And uh, then the alarm bells can go, uh, go off and you can say, right, I need to be really careful with that particular segment because there's no way that 120 people share the same segment and they're all related, especially when it's only 8.1 CMs. You know, that's, that's when the alarm bells start going off. Now, I've developed my own integrated solution, which is simply an Excel spreadsheet. And um, what I have is an ancestral chart. And in this situation, I was asking this, the simple question, is Anne Lester the wife of my great-great-great-grandfather, Thomas Carroll? And what I have here is, first of all, um, these are all of my relatives. These are the descendants on the right, and as you go up, you have the ancestors. So it's going back to an alleged common ancestor for the entire group. 
I know that my most distant known ancestor is Thomas Carroll. Um, the question is, was his wife Anne Lester? Because we couldn't find, we've never found any documentary evidence one way or the other. But we do know that Thomas Carroll had at least three children. And we have, well, I've extensively tested my particular portion of the family. And other people have turned up as matches. And we've established documentary uh, connection to these people. But also, I've been able to put this into a shared autosomal DNA matrix. Um, uh, mentions, this is the one we saw earlier. Those are my dad's results there. These are my uh, cousin's results there. Um, and I have access to my dad's results and to my cousin's results. Um, and that allows me to do A versus B comparisons with all of these other people. But I cannot do a B versus C comparison because this is on ancestry. And even though I, I know that they match each other, I cannot see how much DNA they share with each other. It's not particularly important uh, because I know from documentary evidence how they are all related. But it becomes important when I'm trying to compare my tree with all of these other trees here. Tree B, the patriarch is Thomas Lester. Tree C, patriarch is Bridget Lester, tree D, Paul Lester, and tree E, John Lester. Uh, some of you may have seen my video about my wealthy bachelor capitalist great-great-uncle, uh, James Carroll, who died in San Francisco in 1894 and left $120 million to the Catholic Archbishop of San Francisco. I'll be paying him a visit shortly. Um, but through his will, we were able to establish a possible um, connection with the Lestrange family. And um, now that the what I'm trying to do is establish whether there is a DNA connection between um, these various Lester uh, patriarchs and matriarchs and to see whether it, they all come from the same family and whether they have the same father, Thomas Lester. So that's my current project. And um, what I have been able to found, find is that there is a single match to between some of the participants in, in tree A, my tree, and tree B, this one here. Um, there, is, there are about six of my people match four of the people in, in tree D, Paul Lester, and two of my people match two of the people in tree E. So this is just looking at um, uh, possible links between the various trees. But look at the amount of DNA that's being shared. 11 CMs, 20, 22, 9, 17, 9. Um, and of course, I don't know how much DNA is shared by these people here. All I know is that they are a match. Uh, so we're actually getting below the 20 CM threshold that we saw for clustering. So this is almost getting beyond clustering. And what I need access to is all of those um, matches within my dad's group of matches that are less than 20 CMs. So what I've done from this particular exercise is I've shown that tree A, which is my tree, appears to be connected to tree D, which is the red one, and tree E, which is the green one, maybe tree B, but there's only one, that's based on a single, um, a single connection so far. There's no evidence of a link to tree C as yet. So there weren't any matches between uh, my tree and tree C. Um, there are many connections less than 20 CMs, which is outside the cluster threshold. And the X, like I said previously, refers to unknown total CM. There's no three-way comparison at Ancestry, so I do not know how much DNA is being shared with these people. All I know is that they do share some DNA. I just don't know how much. Coming back to uh, an analysis of my dad's matches, he has 13,250. 20% are eight centimorgans. 13% are nine. 7% are 10. Uh, and so on. So if you when you get up to halfway point, half of his matches are 12 CMs or less. When you get up to the three quarters point, 75% or 15 CMs or less. And it's only 13% that are 
20 CMs or greater. And these are the ones that will qualify for the clusters. But I need to get the access to these ones that are less than 20 in order to get back into the 1700s. Now the question is, how do you do that? And I think there's many ways that you can. In the particular um, example that I'm working on, trying to find out whether Anne Lester is the wife of Thomas uh, Carroll, I can identify potentially relevant clusters that are related to the Carrolls and explore the shared matches with each member of the cluster in turn. So, you know, those people that make it into, let's say, the O'Carroll cluster, I can I can search um, for matches that are shared with that person that are less than the 20 CMs by simply going into each member's um, DNA uh, results, DNA comparison, shared matches comparison, going into each member's uh, shared matches in turn. The other thing I can do is I can shortcut it by searching for the name Carol or the name Lester among all of my matches. And that will just bring up a lot of people who have Lester as a first name and not as a family name, which is what I'm looking for. But I can do that exercise and just go through them one after the other, maybe 100, 200 people to go through. And the other thing is, of course, I can use the theory of family relativity to see if there is a connection between any of um, a, a connection to to my Carroll ancestor or to my Lester ancestor. So there's several ways that I can approach this particular uh, problem. And that kind of brings us on to five techniques for getting back into the 1700s. And this is something I've been thinking about a lot over the last few months. Um, but here's a quick run through five techniques that I've come up with. The first one, of course, is Irish naming convention. And just to, to mention it briefly, the, the custom was to name the first son after the father's father, the second son after the mother's father, and the third son after the father. On the girl's side, the custom was to name the first daughter after the mother's mother, the second one after the father's mother and the third one after the mother. Now, it didn't always work and uh, people didn't always follow it, but I have found it very useful when researching some of my Gleasons. I found that it worked on one side of the family and I was able to establish that both through DNA and documentary evidence. And if it works for you on one side of the family, it probably works on the other side as well. So it works for the mother's side, it probably works for the father's side too. And that is very, very useful in terms of generating speculative names for the parents of your most distant known ancestor. The second technique we've just been talking about, identifying clusters and then building this um, shared autosomal DNA matrix and the associated ancestral chart. And it's something you can easily do in an Excel spreadsheet. And it's a very, very nice way of um, being able to analyze and annotate your clusters. The third thing you can do, and we'll take a very short look at that now, is triangulated segments. Um, and of course, MyHeritage is the only company that offers this in a very, very user-friendly way. The fourth thing you can look at is a Y-DNA match. And that is by testing direct male lines you can establish whether one particular family group is associated with another particular family group. I'm doing this at the moment with my Morgans. Um, and in so doing, I have identified the Y-DNA signature of the Morgans of Old Abbey in Limerick. Uh, the big question is, can we actually connect them to the Morgans of Tredegar in Wales? Uh, because if we can, then that means I am the 11th cousin of Princess Diana. So I have vested interests in making that connection work. Um, but Y-DNA will only work on direct male lines. And in the Leicester example, we saw that some of the families have a matriarch rather than a patriarch. And uh, matriarchs, women, do not have Y-DNA, and therefore they will not pass it down to their descendants. So we can only use this technique for 
uh, family groupings that are headed by a patriarch because only men can pass on Y DNA and it only goes to their sons. It does not go to their daughters. The fifth method we can use for getting back into the 1700s is ancestor reconstruction. If you've tested a large number of your cousins, it is theoretically possible to reconstruct the majority of the genetic signature of maybe your grandmother or your grandfather. And that can be very useful because a grandparent is going to be two generations further up the ancestral line, and therefore they're going to have more DNA of relevance to a particular family surname that you're researching. Now, ancestor reconstruction sounds great in theory. In practice, it doesn't work very well because you can only use it on GEDmatch or on um, uh, Borland Genetics uh, database. So what you'd have to do is you'd have to reconstruct not just your ancestor, but also reconstruct the ancestor of another family tree of interest. And that takes up a lot of time and a lot of organization. Uh, so hopefully that will become more efficient over time. But for now, I think the, the, the best techniques for getting back Irish naming convention, because it's fairly simple to do, but you do need to have all of the children, you need to know all the children, and then you need to know the correct order of their birth, otherwise you're scuppered. Uh, clusters is very, very useful, and triangulated segments is potentially useful. We're gonna take a look at them now, and why DNA is useful if you have a lot of family uh, groups or different, dis dif different trees that have a patriarch. Uh, and also, all the time that you're generating more clues, more hints, it should drive you back to the records to see if you can find further hints in the documentary evidence. So this is the triangulated segment feature on my heritage. It's this little pink icon here. And you can see there's my dad, there's uh, one of his matches, Moira, they share 55. That's your A versus B comparison. A versus C comparison, uh, Carol is 611. Um, uh, and Charles is 492. Uh, B versus C, Moira is 30, shares 30 CMs with Carol and 19 with Charles. So Carol and Charles are my father's first cousins once removed. We know that they are siblings and so that they will be close matches to each other. Um, a triangulated segment, um, which is, there's the various, uh, the names, A, B, C, and D. The triangulated segments are simply shared DNA segments that you and all of the selected DNA matches share with each other, and therefore likely all inherited from a common ancestor. So if we click on this, it brings up the chromosome browser, and this shows that um, Morris and Moira, A versus B, they have a share of 55 segments altogether, They've got a red segment, which is indicated uh, by this red segment here. And that uh, particular segment is actually 35 CMs long. Um, Morris and Carol, the uh, A versus C comparison, they share 611. But you can see that um, Morris, Moira and Carol have an overlapping segment here. So these are uh, Morris and Carol's shared segments in yellow. You can see that the uh, red shared segment and the yellow shared segment overlap. So all three of them uh, share this particular DNA segment here. If we look at Charles, A versus D, we see that Morris, Moira, and Charles, uh, they're matching on the same uh, chromosome, chromosome two, but Charles's match is a lot uh, less. The overlap is a lot less with Charles. It's only 10 CMs, whereas the overlap with Carol um, is 18. But all, um, all three of these, uh, all four of these people will share this triangulated segment. And the idea is, what I'm hoping is, that you know, this is Charles and Carol here. I know exactly where they fit in the family tree. I'm hoping that uh, Moira, and I don't know where exactly she sits, but I'm, I know that she's got Malones. And I have Malones in my particular tree as well and they are somewhere around about down here. So I'm, I'm assuming Moira sits somewhere down here. What I'm hoping for is that they will triangulate back on this shared couple, uh, Thomas Carroll and Anne Lester. And I'm hoping that the DNA that they share was actually passed down from the Lester side of the family, could have been the Carroll side, 
but I'm hoping it was the Leicester side. And that Leicester side will actually allow us to see whether there's a shared DNA segment, a shared triangulated segment with some of the other uh, family trees that we're currently researching. So that's the theory. I'm trying to find a triangulated segment that is shared between people in my family tree and people in these um, four family trees here. So, uh, what? So the next question is: Does anyone else share that same triangulated triangulated segment that all four of them share? And what I did was I exported the shared DNA segment info for all of my DNA matches into an Excel spreadsheet. And my heritage make it very easy for it. You just click on the three dots. This uh, pop-up box comes up, and you click, and it uh, it exported twenty thousand rows of shared DNA segments. And because, and I'm just going to go back to the previous slide, because we know the start and the end point of this segment that is shared by all four people, we can look at chromosome two starting position 105, ending position 114. And if we go down to that, we see that there are uh, 353 ma uh, triangulated matches. That's for the, the entire uh, 35 centimorgan segment that I share with Moira. But just looking at that 10 centimorgan segment, what we find is there's 122 triangulated matches in this region. 17 matches are overhanging the start of the segment, and here's the segment here. 26 matches uh, fall within the 10.7 cm length of the segment, and then 68 matches overhang the end of this particular um, segment we're looking at. And there are 11 people that span the entire length. They're overhanging at either end of this segment that um, we uh, have with Charles, um, that overlaps with Carol, and that overlaps with Moira, and overlaps with me. So uh, this was quite shocking, actually, to see that there were so many triangulated matches. So the next question was, well, what do we do? Uh, which of them are true positives and which of them are false positives? Because some of them really were very, very low amounts of, of uh, CMs in the eight and nine regions. Some of them were even six. So um, some of them may very well be false positives. They may be in pileup regions. Do we go through all 20, 122 of them? I decided to just focus on those that look to be greater than 10 centimorgans. And this, this gave me a much more manageable cluster of 23 people with a triangulated segment. And that brought me back to surnames Malone, uh, surname Mulligan, um, uh, the district of the Midlands, and around about the 1820 time point. This is a work in progress. It's still going on. But the good news is that Malone is a surname that is linked to my O'Carrolls. So I feel I'm on the right track. Uh, also, the O'Carrolls were pawnbrokers and had a cartel of pawnbroking establishments in the Midlands in Ireland. So this is just uh, an example of the hours and hours of work that you can throw at these, this type of um, analysis. But ultimately, it will hopefully allow me to address that question and answer the question, is Anne Lester the wife of Thomas Carroll? And I feel I'm on the right track because I'm uh, coming across a surname that is recognizable in my family tree, and I'm coming back to a place, a location, that I know that my ancestors came from. So it may take uh, another couple of hours of work to just find out exactly how uh, this particular cluster of triangulated segments is related to my O'Carroll, Malone, and Lester family. So that really is um, uh, everything I'm going to talk about today. And um, now we can probably l open it up for questions. And it just remains for me to thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to uh, having a nice little chat now. 
So Esther, I will pass it back to you. Okay, thank you so much. I see so many comments here about how detailed the presentation was and how uh, some of our viewers will have to re-watch it in order to, to get oh, all there's the a lot there. there is a lot there. And the, will this be available now on the website? So exactly, that's what I wanted to explain to everyone that after the after the session is over, it will be available and you can watch this Facebook Live on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash myheritage under the video section. So you'll be able to watch this one as well as all of our other fa Facebook Lives, all the past ones. So uh, definitely check it out. I know there's so much information, Morris, that you gave everyone today that everyone will want to catch up on and rewatch. So uh, it'll be very useful, I think, for them to, to rewatch it. Fantastic. So we do have a couple questions from the audience that we right. can uh, get to. So I'll start with a question from Carol. And she asks, do you have suggestions for how to record somewhere a family member who you don't know where they fit in, but you do know that they are part of your family heritage? Well, um, it very much depends on what kind of program you're using. Um, I, I have got trees on, on my heritage. I've got trees on ancestry. What I tend to do is I will, there's several things. I will, if, if I know that they are connected, I might add them on somewhere to the family tree, perhaps by, by creating a uh, sibling or a child labeled unknown or speculative, and then have, having that person as, as a child or a grandchild of that particular uh, speculative answer, uh, speculative um, ancestor. Now, um, that would be one way of doing it. Uh, the other thing that one could possibly do is create what I call a floating person. So it's somebody that uh, you can you can attach them to uh, anybody within your tree, put in all of their details, and then go into their profile and then detach them, detach their parents, so they become floating within your family tree. And then you can use the, the function, the search function, to look for them whenever you want to, uh, uh, if you have further information that you need to add into their particular profile. OK, great. Um, I see Lori says, thank you so much for this. I will be using a lot of these methods later today. So I Good. know. Yeah, I know you give a lot of a lot of our viewers out there some homework to, to take home. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, we have a question here from Lisa, and she asks, do you have any suggestions on how to reach out to people who did DNA for the ethnicity results? I sometimes find it frustrating when I'm reaching out to DNA connections, but I don't receive any answers. OK, you and me both, which is why I have no hair. So uh, this is one of the most frustrating things is when you don't have immediate access to a family tree and you have to actually go in through the process of contacting your match. By the time they reply, you may have forgotten why you talked to them in the first place. Uh, but what I would suggest is for those, for, for, for most matches, I like to keep it very, very short and sweet. So I don't write a whole thesis or four page summary of my genealogical question. Um, I would say to them something along the lines of, uh, hi there, I, we share 45 CMs of DNA, uh, suggesting that we may be third or fourth cousins. I see that you have, well, if, if, they've done, if they don't have a family tree, you cannot really um, see uh, if they have particular ancestral names that may be relevant. But what you can do is you can see, say, um, based on the fact that you match some of my relatives, I know that we're connected via my O'Carroll and Malone line, for example. Do you have any ancestors called O'Carroll or Malone? Um, and then I would ask them, uh, do you have a family tree online that I could look at? And then I would just simply sign off and say, uh, looking forward to solving this mystery. So very, very short and sweet. And asking maybe one, two, or three questions. Because what you're trying to do here 
is you're trying to hook them in. You're trying to, it's like fishing. You're trying to engage them in a conversation, number one. So the easier your questions will be to answer, the more likely they are going to be to respond to those questions. So a lot of the time I would just ask a simple question, do you have any O'Carroll or Malone ancestors? Uh, looking forward to hearing from you, kind regards. And just keep it simple. Uh, and once you, they, you get the first reply, then you can ask some of the other questions you want to ask. The whole idea is to start a to and fro conversation. Um, and that, uh, if you can get that going, then you are in a very good place to get the information that you need from that particular match. Okay, I see a question here from Karen. Uh, how do I find out whether I'm related to royalty? So Karen, actually, we, it's a common question that we do get quite a lot. And we actually have a Facebook Live next week about determining if you're related to royalty. So, so make sure to stay tuned. Um, and on our blog, blog.myheritage.com, we list all the upcoming, we have a blog post with all the upcoming Facebook Live sessions. So make sure to check it out and you can tune in at the correct time to watch that session. Um, we'll just take one last question, Morris, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, we have a question here from Gloria and she asks, is there a way to determine common a common link between two matches from both sides of a family? So a common link between two matches from both sides of the family. What does What does she mean exactly by that? Um, Gloria, if you're in the audience, feel free to, to comment in the comment section and clarify. Um, Does not she mean exactly. That, yes, I'm not sure whether she means that there's two separate ancestral couples that, you know, they two people are related, it could be via couple A or it could be via couple B. Um, I'm not sure if that's what she, she, she means by that particular question, but could you just read it out again, Esther, just to? Sure. She says, is there a way to determine common link between two matches from both sides of a family? A common link. Well, if if there is a common link, then it should show up in the DNA. So presumably both people have been DNA tested. And if they have been DNA tested, and if there is a link there, it should show up in the DNA. Oh, she's written, uh, Gloria has written in the comments, uh, she said, one match from her father's side and one match from the mother's side. Right, okay, I see that now. Um, well, Gloria, if if there is a common link, then um, it will show up in the DNA. So if it, if you find that um, the, uh, the two matches, your paternal match and your maternal match, don't actually match each other, then uh, there is no genetic link there. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a genealogical link, because for example, if they were fifth cousins, um, there's a good chance that they just, by, by the luck of the genetic lottery, they wouldn't actually have had DNA that trickled down to both of them. Um, so they may not actually share DNA. They may still be genealogically related, um, but they just, just by the, the luck of the draw, the DNA has not trickled down from the common ancestor to both of them. So they don't have any shared DNA segments. However, if you tested, say, a sibling on either side, uh, you may find that um, the sibling on the paternal side actually does match the, uh, the person on the maternal side, or may even match the sister. Or you may find that the first paternal person uh, does match the second, the sibling on the, on the maternal side. So you may have to test uh, several family members on both sides to find uh, these more distant uh, connections genetically. So just because you don't have a genetic connection to a known fifth cousin does not mean that you're not genealogically connected. You would actually have to test several people and this is the advantage of testing several relatives. And what you may find is that some of the relatives on one side will match some of the relatives on the other side, and that will support the genealogical question between the two separate families. 
Okay, fantastic. I just see so many great comments that have come in um, about just uh, your explanation. Morris was just so, uh, so in depth. And I see Dorothy said, this is fantastic. I'm just looking at how to use all of the tools at MyHeritage and the benefits. Good. We have um, Highwell who said, I've got to say the chromosome browser on MyHeritage is excellent. Um, Kyla said, I had no idea that my heritage could do B versus C. Great for a genealogy DNA detective. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's one of the best features of my heritage. So I think a lot, a lot of knowledge was uh, passed on today and we are just so appreciative. It was, it was so, uh, so well received by this uh, audience here. Um, and now we get to give away a my heritage DNA kit to one lucky uh -huh. winner. So very exciting part of the show. Um, just to remind everyone that if you don't win today, we we, hope, we wish you all could win, but, but if you don't win today, uh, we do have our Easter sale going on at MyHeritage, and we have put a link in the comment section, so make sure to check it out. And as Moore said, it, the, there are so many advantages to just testing more and more individuals in your family. So definitely check that out. So the winner today uh, for a MyHeritage DNA kit is Sheila Foy. And Sheila wrote us and she said, I never knew how to use these tools. You make it so easy to understand. Thank you. And she said, I would love to find my paternal family. So far after a long search, no true match has been found. So Sheila, we really hope that uh, this DNA kit will help you in your journey and it will help you maybe break through that brick wall and uh, gain some more information on your paternal family. And uh, we'll be in touch with you through private message to claim your prize. So uh, Morris, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, my pleasure. And thank you to everyone who has uh, stayed the whole course for the entire presentation. And, and a great big thank you to, to you, Esther, and the entire team at MyHeritage for, for organizing these MyHeritage Live uh, uh, webinars. So uh, thank you to you too. And have a great day, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye.